how they are comparing to uh, glioblastomas, for example, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, looking forward to, to see your presentation and maybe we can comment on that. Are you looking forward for the vaccines? Yes, we are. <laughs> we are. There is, there is talks that they're going to start vaccinating us as early as December here. And uh, it looks like they will start with Pfizer. I heard that uh, as early as 4th of December, I might be offered to get a vaccine. Uh, but let's see what's going to happen. Yeah, so they we we don't have um, a vaccine rollout plan that's been articulated yet in in Canada. So looking forward to that. So we will we will see. But the Canadian government has has purchased uh, I think forty million uh, vaccination kits. So there we're. Uh, okay. They are organizing quite, um, they're organizing here. I, I hear about GP practices being organized to, to become uh, vaccination points. And um, yes, it looks like there is an there is a organization being um, set up here now. Mm -hmm. um, they're really thinking of starting within, next, within a month or so. Oh, well, that would be great. That would be great, right? I, well, I, I, and I hope it works. <laughs> let's hope, yeah. Let's hope it will be great and it works, yeah. Exactly. Hi, hi Michael. How are you? Good hi, to see you. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, how are you, Nick? All good? Is Wilco okay. here? Oh, we, don't don't see, we don't see Wilco as yet. Okay, let me just message him. Welcome, Michael. Good to have you. Finally, we, we got you and we, somehow there were some delays, but finally you're here. Good to, you know, it's, it's really our pleasure that you're here. Uh, my pleasure as well. Thank you for the invitation. Wilco is up, so let's call him. So I videotaped my talk and um, I think uh, I just asked the, um, the coordinators to play the video, but I will stay on live for question and answer. Mad, you're ready for it? You have the talk? Yes, sir, I have it. I, I'm ready. Okay, just, yeah. You've got another, yeah. Wilco has come in as well. That's good. Paolo has joined. Hi, Wilco. Hi, good to see you. Hi, good luck in a moment. <laughs> Hi, good morning, Wilco. Hi. Sorry, I was a little bit on the last minute, but uh, I had to rush. <laughs> how is how is uh, how is your Hi. job there at the moment? You're still there. Yeah, I'm still there, but uh, like everywhere, it's busy with reorganizing with Corona. So, but uh, yeah, it's okay. What's what's the weather like there? Oh, it is uh, sunny, but very cold. Not like really? you. <laughs> <laughs> you have it hot, I think. Hey. Um, it's not bad. It's uh, about you know, between 25 to 30 degrees, so it's okay. Oh, it's okay. sunny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, sounds, uh, that sounds delightful. <laughs> we, see, we see these temperatures in Belfast only a couple of days a year. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not sure about 30, yeah. 55 maybe. <laughs> yeah, we we had a, um, it was actually uh, about 15 degrees yesterday, Wilco, here in Toronto. 15 degrees. Yeah, yeah. Is that due to the global warming or what? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it should, be, it should be colder, isn't it? There, in uh, you know, uh, Toronto is further south than you think. Okay. We're at 44, uh, we're at 44 degrees and we have the, 
basically the inland seas known as the Great Lakes. So they, they moderate the, the climate. And um, uh, Southern Ontario is at the same latitude as Northern California. Okay. So it, it, it's warmer than you might, uh, it's warmer than you might think it is. Okay. But we still get real winter, make no mistake. Like I think we're supposed to get snow this week. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, bragging a little bit about our uh, degree <laughs> weather. Fair enough, guys. Shall we start, uh, Nikolay, um, Paolo? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. By the more. <laughs> so I think it's 12.01 now, so probably it's a good idea to, to crack on. Yeah. So shall we start starting? Everybody said okay. So um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, to present to you uh, Professor Michael Felling from uh, Canada. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy, uh, advances, uh, future directions, pathophysiology, and management uh, of, uh, of that disease. Uh, speaking about uh, cervical myelopathy and uh, uh, being delivered by Professor Felling, I don't think we have to say more. So please, Michael. Good morning. I'm Michael Fellings from the University of Toronto. And I'm uh, very pleased to speak with you uh, today on uh, advances in future directions in the pathophysiology and management of degenerative cervical myelopathy. And I'll take the perspective of where have we been, where are we now, and where are we going? Right at the outset, I wish to acknowledge and thank the World Spinal Column Society and the WFNS Spine Committee for this uh, invitation to speak to you uh, today. I wish to acknowledge uh, the moderators and the uh, coordinator for their uh, kind support and invitation. I have no commercial disclosures. I am the principal investigator, however, on a few uh, trials and projects that I will be discussing today. I uh, work at the University of uh, Toronto, and Toronto is a beautiful city. And once the COVID uh, restrictions um, have passed, I, I would uh, welcome any of you to visit us in our city. And I wish to also acknowledge the tremendous team of people that work with me. What I'll be talking to you about is uh, somewhat reminiscent of this um, uh, famous Paul Gauguin uh, painting, Du venons nous que sommes nous, où allons nous? In the English translation, where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? And this is, in a sense, what I will reflect today. So here's the outline. I will uh, talk about the concept of degenerative cervical myelopathy, including the pathobiology. I'll discuss surgical options and also the evidence that surgery is effective. I'll present guidelines. And importantly, I'll talk about knowledge gaps in future directions and um, in two principal areas. So, so one is optimizing the management of mild degenerative cervical myelopathy and present to you the potential for um, a personalized medicine approach and perhaps using microstructural MRI as an imaging biomarker. And I'll talk about optimizing neurological outcomes and I'll present to you hot off the press the um, results of the CSM Protect uh, study, which will be coming out in publication in the near future. There are three learning objectives. One is to define the concept of DCM. Secondly, is to articulate the current guidelines for the management of DCM. And thirdly, is to be aware of the key knowledge gaps in our understanding of DCM. We coined the term degenerative cervical myelopathy a few years ago in an effort to try to unify a variety of diagnoses that encompass the conditions resulting in benign non-neoplastic non-traumatic pathologies, including CSM, OPLL, and other conditions. There are three critical factors involved in the pathophysiology of DCM. There are static factors which result in compression and ongoing ischemia. There are dynamic factors related to dynamic compression, axial tension on the neural elements, and this is related to instability, which is there, and the alignment. And then there are biomolecular factors. So 
um, DCM is a form of spinal cord injury, a non-traumatic form of spinal cord injury. And there are many factors involved, but inflammation, ischemia, and excitotoxicity are key factors. One of the take-home messages for you is to use the modified Japanese Orthopedic Association scale to classify degenerative cervical myelopathy into mild, moderate, and severe. And there, are, there are outcomes related to motor dysfunction in the upper and lower extremities, sensory dysfunction, and sphincter dysfunction. Now also, there's a knowledge gap here because while the MGOA is probably the best outcome measure we currently have, there are limitations, and in particular, it's rather insensitive to the detection of change in the mild uh, realm. We know very little about the genetics of degenerative cervical myelopathy, and this represents an opportunity for the future as we consider a personalized medicine approach. We recognize that there are certain congenital conditions, including clinical file syndrome, that predispose individuals to DCM. Uh, there have been some uh, genealogical clustering studies which have uh, shown uh, uh, familial uh, tendencies um, for the transmission of um, uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy. And it's also recognized that OPLL has a higher incidence amongst Asian, and there are linkages to certain uh, genes, including the NPPS uh, gene. But this is certainly uh, an area of opportunity for the future. I'll present to you the concept that degenerative cervical myelopathy is a form of non-traumatic spinal cord injury. And here, the predominant type of cell death is not necrotic, but is genetically programmed cell death or apoptosis. Using animal models of this condition, including the, um, the twi twi mouse that develops spontaneous ossification of ligamentum flavum at C1, C2 with a spastic quadriparesis, and in combination with human um, uh, uh, postmortem pathology uh, uh, data, we had this report in brain a few years ago, and we showed evidence that um, neural cells undergo a program cell death, and this is related to activation of a death receptor called the FAST death receptor. And from this emerges um, some of the initial concepts around the pathophysiology of degenerative cervical myelopathy. Chronic compression leads to ischemia. This can activate death receptors and lead to program cell death, and in addition, there's disruption of the blood spinal cord barrier, which leads to inflammation triggered by microglia as well as T cells. Now, surgery is the mainstay of the management for patients with moderate and severe DCM. And we have uh, excellent surgical options, and this is an area of ongoing um, uh, development. So I just thought I would share with you a few cases and a few perspectives that I have. So this is a patient who has a kyphotic deformity with at disc level, and the deformity is partially reducible. And in my hands, I really like the multi-level anterior cervical discectomy infusion procedure. And this um, is usually done as a standalone uh, procedure. And this had an excellent outcome in this patient. And on occasion, one com can combine this with a corpectomy in this so-called hybrid type of an option. And the um, addition of the midpoint of fixation uh, provides excellent biomechanical stability. You'll see again that this is done as a standalone procedure. There are also excellent posterior approaches. I tend to favor the uh, posterior laminectomy infusion approaches, particularly with patients with uh, uh, cervical spondylosis, multi-level pathology with relative maintenance of the cervical lordosis. But laminoplasty is also an excellent option, particularly in the setting of uh, OPLL with a, a straight or lordotic uh, cervical spine. And on occasion, combined anterior and posterior approaches um, are uh, indicated, especially in situations such as this one where there's a fixed kyphosis and where multi-level anterior decompression reconstruction is required. And then I like to combine this with a posterior decompression and reconstruction of the posterior tension band. Now, DCM has a tremendous impact on the individual, on society, and on caregivers. And truthfully, we uh, lack um, granular data, but it's clear that there are significant economic productivity losses and, and costs related to disability and impairment, and the impact on the patient are tremendous. We can infer the, uh, the costs of uh, caring for patients with cerebral spinal cord injury from the traumatic um, 
uh, spinal cord injury uh, literature. And if you look to the right of this uh, a, a graph, you consider patients who are 50 years of age who have preservation of neurological uh, function, we see that the cost can run into the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. So this is an expensive condition. Now we've also evolved in terms of our concepts in the treatment of DCM. And currently, we really lack data on any non-operative uh, uh, algorithms. And this does represent a knowledge gap. It's also clear that many patients will decline without uh, a treatment. And recent evidence has shown the effectiveness of surgical intervention. This was one such study which I um, uh, led a few years ago through the North American AO group. And here we found in a prospective series of uh, uh, patients, significant improvements on the MGOA score, reductions in impairment as shown uh, by reductions in neck disability index, and dramatic improvements in the SF36 physical and mental component scores. And this was uh, a couple of years later, replicated by our group at the international level, showing identical uh, results. So very robust improvements in outcomes with surgical intervention. And so recent evidence has resulted in a paradigm shift. When I was a resident, we were taught that surgery was a last resort, and at best we could uh, offer patients the idea that it would halt neurological deterioration. We now recognize that surgery is not a last resort and should be indicated at a much earlier uh, stage in the course of the patient's um, uh, illness and generally will result in improvement in neurological function. Now, there remained a knowledge gap, and this is the fact that surgery is expensive. So is a surgery for DCM cost effective? So in an effort to um, fill this knowledge gap, we undertook the following health economics um, analysis, and I wish to acknowledge uh, Chris uh, Whithugh, who at that time was a master's student um, in, our, uh, in our group. So we took uh, the data from the North American and International AO uh, studies, and then we used uh, accurate micro-costing data, which are uh, available uh, in Ontario to define the costs of the, uh, of, the, of the surgery. And the perspective here was that from the healthcare uh, payer. To assess the outcomes, we measured health utilities using the SF6D, and this did show very substantial improvements in quality of life with surgical intervention. From this, we then calculated what's called, what's called an incremental cost utility ratio, or ICER, where you're looking at the cost of surgery versus the cost of non-operative management, and then looking at the relative um, utilities of surgery versus non-operative management. And then we use the WHO definition of what constitutes a cost-effective intervention. And this is the cost to gain one quality of uh, adjusted life year, or an ICER, which is less than the value of the gross domestic product per capita. And in Canada, this is $54,000 uh, Canadian. We used in a Markov transition state model to model all the different uh, forms of uh, treatment that could be applied to a patient with DCM. But basically what this shows is what happens when we model surgical intervention versus non-operative intervention. How many patients improve, how many patients deteriorate, and then what are the relative costs of, of this. And then based on this, we found that surgery was highly cost effective with, with an average ICER of less than $12,000 per quality adjusted life year. And when we modeled this using a Monte Carlo sensitivity analysis, we found that 98% of the, of the time, uh, surgery was the uh, pre preferred um, uh, treatment and was highly cost effective. And this work uh, received the um, outstanding paper award from the North American Spine uh, Society. And again, I wish to acknowledge uh, uh, Chris Whithugh, who, um, who did his graduate work at University of uh, Chicago uh, on this project. Given this background, uh, we felt that it was time to initiate a guidelines uh, process for the management of DCM. And this was undertaken through the support of uh, AO Spine, the uh, Cervical Spine Research Society, and our University of Toronto Spine program. 
To undertake this, we use what's called the GRADE process, and this is a two-step process. The first is to have high-quality systematic reviews, and then one has a multidisciplinary guideline development group. And this is one of the forest plots uh, from the systematic reviews, and this is shown in the box in red on the right. And what this uh, 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 shows um, is that uh, the um, mean effectiveness of surgical um, intervention is consistently to the right of the zero effectiveness line, meaning that surgery is highly uh, effective at short term, six to 12 months, and at longer term uh, follow up. We then put together a multidisciplinary guidelines development group, which included a, a number of professional disciplines, as well as individuals who, with a life experience with this condition. And this uh, illustrates the grade process where you take the best available evidence, you look at the clinical acceptability, consider patient values, look at benefits versus harms and costs. And from this, we came up with the following recommendations. So for moderate and severe DCM, the recommendations are very clear that surgery is recommended. For mild DCM, things become somewhat more gray. And depending on the patient and physician preference, one might recommend surgery or perhaps a trial of structured non-operative treatment. And then if the patient fails to improve or deteriorates, surgery can be considered as the preferred option. Now, we recognize that uh, patients have varied outcomes as well, and we've tried to get a handle on this in the development of clinical prediction uh, models. And this was one such effort that our group um, published, and I want to acknowledge uh, Lindsay Tetro, um, who uh, obtained her PhD in our group using this, um, uh, this work. So the key factors that we found that predicted outcome for cervical myelopathy included age, the duration of symptoms, the presence of psychiatric comorbidities, in particular depression of bipolar disorder, whether patients smoke, uh, the baseline level of impairment as assessed by the MGOA, and in addition, the extent of a disability as modeled by the presence of an impaired gait. Now, there remain many knowledge gaps, and this will define the future directions. We do need to optimize the management of mild degenerative cervical myelopathy. We need a better understanding of the natural history. We need improved biomarkers. We uh, need to evolve to a personalized medicine approach, perhaps using uh, genetics. And also, microstructural MRI could be a useful imaging biomarker. And I'll show you some evidence around this. We also need to optimize neurological outcomes. And here there is an opportunity for the translation of some of the basic science discoveries in regenerative medicine to the clinic. And I will uh, briefly present to you uh, the first randomized controlled trial of a potential neuroprotective drug in the setting of DCM, namely uh, the sodium channel blocker, Riliazole. Uh, this is uh, a work from uh, two former PhD students in um, uh, my group, Alan Martin and David Kudat, and this was in conjunction with our uh, wonderful um, MRI physicist, uh, Julian cohen at the University of uh, Mon Montreal. And essentially, what we um, would present to you is that there are a variety of tools that can be used at a practical level in the MRI suite to help define uh, the structural integrity of the spinal cord. One can look at T2-weighted, T2-star-weighted imaging to assess atrophy and compression, magnetization transfer ratio to look at demyelination, DTI and fractional anosotropy to assess axonal injury. And in particular, I want to leave you with the idea of using the T2-star-weighted imaging, looking at the white matter to gray matter ratio as a surrogate um, uh, uh, marker of the severity of, of injury and potentially a predictor for patients' outcomes. I again wish to acknowledge Julian Cohen Adad and would invite you to um, look at the spinal cord a toolbox that Julian has made uh, freely available. So this is uh, some of Alan's uh, PhD uh, work and uh, Alan um, found evidence that um, T2 star weighted white matter to gray matter signal intensity ratio was a very helpful biomarker for non-traumatic spinal cord injury or degenerative cervical myelopathy. And these were some representative images um, uh, from his uh, work. And I would invite um, uh, any of you uh, to um, 
to use these algorithms and, and please uh, contact me if you would like some further information on this. I now wish to uh, transition toward a, a brief presentation on the outcomes of the CSM Protect randomized controlled trial. And this is looking at the repurposing of a drug called Riliazole, which is a sodium glutamate antagonist. It's an FDA approved medication used to attenuate nerve cell degeneration in ALS. And we're using this in a repurposing uh, fashion to see the effects in degenerative cervical myelopathy. So why is this important? Well, we recognize that while most patients do improve with surgery, the improvement is imperfect. Most patients do have residual neurological impairment and not everyone uh, does well. So if we look at this uh, a graph here on the, on the right, we see that most patients improve, but the extent of improvement will vary. Some patients here in green do not improve and a small number of patients continue to decline. And this um, pie chart on the left shows that there is a low but definite rate of perioperative neurological complications. And in these uh, basic science studies, um, our group showed that uh, Riliazole blocks perioperative ischemia reperfusion injury. And this is probably one of the key factors related to the development of delayed C5 palsy. And in addition, Riliazole attenuates neuropathic pain and enhances functional recovery in animal models of ECM. So given this, we designed the following randomized control trial. The protocol was uh, published a number of years ago in SPINE, is all, also in clinicaltrials.gov. This was a multi-center placebo-controlled double-blind randomized trial in 16 sites across North America in 300 patients. And patients were randomized to receive Riliazole or placebo two weeks prior to surgery and then four weeks after the surgery. The main outcome measure was a change in the MGOA score at six months, which uh, in hindsight, may have not been the best um, outcome measure uh, to use, but that's the one we decided upon. And we had a variety of secondary uh, outcome measures, importantly, looking at uh, pain. So uh, 290 patients ultimately underwent a surgery, mean age of 58 uh, years, and 90% uh, follow-up was achieved. You can't read this table, but we looked at a whole variety of baseline characteristics and to the, for the most part, the groups were well matched. Complication rates overall were low, and Riliazol was very safe and well tolerated. So here's the impact on the MGOA. The first thing to point out was that we did not see a difference between Riliazol and placebo on this outcome measure. What we did see, and what we validated again, was that there were very large improvements in the, in the MGOA score with surgery. My hypothesis here is that the MGOA may lack the sensitivity to detect um, a change in um, neurological function and that better outcome measures are required. However, on the pre-planned secondary analyses, including uh, the VAS scores for neck and arm pain, we did see um, a beneficial effect favoring Riliazole, suggesting that Riliazole may attenuate neuropathic pain in these individuals. And this was actually translated to an improvement in the SF36 physical function uh, scores. It was also associated with subtle improvements in the Asian motor scores, largely reflecting hand intrinsic um, improvements. So what we found was that a six week perioperative course of Riliazole as an adjunct to surgical decompression did not have a significant benefit on the primary outcome, namely the MGOA, but did appear to have a very promising effects on three predetermined secondary outcomes, and importantly, including pain. So I think that this is um, uh, potentially interesting work, and I would encourage people to explore the use of Riliazole in their own practices. And some of the questions that emerge are, would a longer duration of treatment have been beneficial? We use six weeks, would three months or six months have been more beneficial? And we need more sensitive outcome measures, for example, looking at hand function, better outcome measures to look at disability impairment and pain. So in closing, here are the take home messages. Degenerative cervical myelopathy is the commonest cause of spinal cord impairment in the world. Surgical treatment of DCM is safe, improves neurological function, quality of life, and is cost effective. And in the future, we need to increase the awareness of the DCM and I wish to have a shout out for the AO Spine uh, Recode uh, project being uh, led by one of our former uh, fellows, Mark 
uh, Cotter, who's now on faculty at Cambridge University and his uh, student Ben Davies. We need to optimize the management for patients with mild DCM, and there's an opportunity to develop imaging, serological, and genetic biomarkers. And finally, we um, have a tremendous opportunity to translate the wealth of basic science work related to neuroprotection and neuroregeneration and try to see if we can use this to enhance the outcome of our patients with degenerative cervical myelopathy. And on that note, I'd like to close. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation to speak, and I'm happy to address any uh, uh, questions in the discussion period. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. It was a really elucidating uh, presentation, and um, we've seen all the, the news and all the trends. And I really enjoy that, and I'm sure the audience as well. Um, shall we leave the questions at the end, or shall we um, uh, continue now with uh, probably Wilco and then uh, have a discussion on that? Uh, Salman, what do you think about that? Whatever you like, it's fine. We can do both ways. I think probably we just uh, crack on with the next presentation and uh, then... Um, uh, yeah, you can, you can ask people to put their questions on the chat in the meantime, and then in the end you can you know ask questions from the chat. That is another uh, yeah? good okay. question as well. Yes. Okay. So, uh, do we still have uh, Paolo? Paolo, do you want to present uh, Wilco? I think we have um, uh, lost Paolo. Yeah, Paolo is not here. You carry on, please. Okay, so it is uh, my pleasure to um, present uh, Professor Will Coppell, uh, um, who, who is a professor and ch chair in, uh, in Haag Leiden University, Netherlands. Uh, he, will, uh, he will talk to us about cervical trauma classification um, and uh, upper C-spine fractures. Um, pleasure to, to have you with, with us and looking forward for another uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. You can all see the presentation. Well, it's a very big honor to, um, to be invited to, uh, to present here. And I just already put in the chat it's very difficult that we don't see each other, but it feels a little bit social of distance. So um, I'm very happy uh, that we can do this and that there are so many people in the audience. It's also a very uh, big honor that I talk after Michael Felix, who is my uh, well example of how we can combine surgery with science. And uh, he's one of the, I think, first neurosurgeons who uh, promoted clinical epidemiological science and also bio basic science in, um, in their surgery. So um, again, thanks for the example. And I will discuss spine trauma and I won't look in detail into spinal cord injury, although the reason that we do everything is to prevent um, patients having very severe disability after spinal cord injury. And that's the reason why we need a classification. I talk on behalf of uh, the spine section and neurotrauma section or committees of WFNS. And also thank Salman and Mehmet for all the work they have done until now, so that we have a global um, issue about these classifications. So my conflicts of interest uh, are nearly the same like Michael. I have some commercial sponsorships, but the most important thing is that I'm also leading a quite big large department in two cities, Leiden and The Hague. So everything I say about surgery, there might be some, well, pre that I am uh, more in favor of surgery compared to conserved treatment because that's also part of my work. And secondly, um, I'm also in the board of uh, the National Health Insurance um, giving sponsorship to studies. So that's also a conflict of interest. So why do we need a classification? Because what we did do was already quite good. Um, well, it's very important that we can discuss with each other the morphology, the neurology, and also try to interpret the intactness of the disco ligamentous complex, DLC. So we want to predict prognosis, not only for the patient and his family also, but 
also the kind of treatment options. So which interaction and surgical approach or conservative approach is the best value for the patient. So this classification system should be descriptive and the gradation should be based on severity. And for us all, as we are sitting here, we have insight in each other's spine trauma patients and prognostication and help each other in treatment decisions. So when you look at etiology and mechanism, this was 20 to 30 years ago. So when we talked about spine trauma, young people, a lot of sport accidents, also traffic accidents, but currently there's changed a lot. And if I talk to the spinal cord injury patient organizations, they say, well, all your treatment algorithms are for the younger people. Well, currently we are becoming older and in 20 years, I'm this guy trying to serve uh, the sea in Portugal. But um, it might be not a good idea, but the thing is that there are more traumas in elderly. So if I look, and I don't know about all your departments, but if I look at my own department, more than 50% of our patients currently have spinal cord injury or spine fractures at an elderly age. And this is an increasing problem in our society. So we have to deal with that and also maybe adapt our classification schemes. So this is what I showed here. I was not allowed by my trainer to use uh, distances and angles because he said to me, and maybe some of you recognize that, well, you are a nurse surgeon and you are not an orthopedic surgeon, so you don't want to measure angles and distances. Well, it's very important. So please all use your um, kind of measurement, try to have metrics to look at distances, look at angles, and also, for instance, look at kyphotic angles. Because it facilitates communication between each other, even on distance. So if one of you has a very difficult spine fracture, you can call and say, well, I see this distance, I see this angulation. Currently, you can also look with the WhatsApp. It helps you in making the treatment decisions and also helps you in follow-up. And we have to be aware that all the studies we did until now, um, also the studies by Michael Failings, but also studies by Vaccaro, they looked at the classification. It is already validated in their clinics, but we didn't use it at the global level. And I'm a proponent to do that in the future. So if we look at the classification systems until now for the Cervical Spine Research Society, and recently with consensus meeting, meetings um, with the World Federation of Neurological Societies, WFNS, about spine trauma. And if we work that way and we collect our data, it might be that we have in five to 10 years an enormous answer to a lot of questions. I won't go into detail in the subaxial spine because the time limit is for subaxial spine and upper C spine too much. But it's very important to look at the papers of Vaccaro and also later papers and use for the subaxial C spine the SLIC system. It looks at neurology, morphology, and also at the disco ligamentous complex. You can use the numbers, but it might also be intuitive. It's very important that if you look at the amount of neurological, neurological deficit, that a complete neurological deficit has less points than an incomplete deficit. The reason is that we hope that people can improve with an incomplete deficit. The question is, is that the right approach? I'm not very sure if a patient in a complete uh, tetraplegic or paraplegic patient comes in in the urgent phase and you have to decide for surgery if the, if the acute phase is a very good phase to look at it. But that's probably for the discussion. So these WFNS recommendations, you can find them on our website. It's very important to have the um, approach which we use to immobilize the C-spine. Although the trauma surgeons are not using collars, we propose collars. There are certain distances which are 
measured metrics like the anterior atlanto dental interval of three millimeter, but it might be very much more importantly to look at your posterior atlanto dental interval with a superior cervical spine injury. Because the posterior interval is more important for the spinal cord and also the medulla oblongata. Before placing your screws, always look at your CT scan. And if you don't have a CT scan in your neighborhood and you have to do an urgent surgery, then open up quite widely that you see your anatomy so that you put in your screws, especially in the high C-spine, being aware of a vertebral artery, which might be large on one side and occluded on the other side. So if I look at occipital condyle fractures, so that's the most upper part. In the past, we didn't see that much. And we thought that most of those patients died. Currently, with current CT scans, we see more and more fractures in the condyle. But are those important? Most of them can be treated without surgery, only conservative treatment. We do not advise cervical traction for atlanto dental and atlanto occipital distances. So don't use traction for those cases because that is a big risk um, that you have with your traction as you can traction, put traction on your spinal cord or your medulla omelgata. So we propose from W of NES the Mueller classification and look at your distances and most are conservative but if there is a bilateral, well, you can do that and uh, you do a crane cervical fixation. It might also be that if you have severe brain trauma and spinal cord injury, it might be that you have an atlanta occipital dislocation. You have to look at it. And if you suspect it, it might be better to promote surgery in early phase only in the very severe cases. Mm -hmm. Well, the C1 fractures are more commonly approached. You all know them. All of you are trained in that. And it's quite easy. In the past, we used an open mouth view to look at the distances and look at the rule of spans. If this distance A plus B, look at the lateral line of C2 and the lateral line of C1. If that's more than seven millimeter, it indicates transfer for lagman rupture, and you might discuss surgery for those patients. But sometimes it's still easy to look at it at a conservative way and follow it up. But in my clinics, we use this distance. If more than seven millimeter, we discuss instability, risk of neurological deficit, and we are having low threshold for doing surgery. But most atlas fractures don't have a ligament rupture of the transverse ligament and can be treated without surgery. So this is a diagram of the algorithm of isolated, isolated atlas fractures. And there's consensus that if it is intact, you don't need to have surgery. You can have a Philadelphia collar, sometimes a Somi brace. I nearly never use them for C2 fractures. Halo braces are used still worldwide quite widely. Um, we don't use it, a halo brace, because we think it makes a lot of patients worse, but it can, can be a good idea for some patients. If I need a halo brace, for instance, in this group, then I go for surgery, going for C1, C2 fusion. Sometimes you can do a direct C1 fusion and connect the fracture lines by compression of a rod in this area. So then we can go to the odontoid fractures, a little bit lower. And this is one of the fractures which we see more and more commonly in the elderly. And that's also part of a big study we are now running in Europe, looking at those different fractures. So the type one, type two, and type three, I don't have to explain them to all of you because you know it. The type three is quite important because it's a large, large uh, area where you have feeding of arterial vessels. So there's a good consolidation possibility. But some type, D, type three fractures are still type two fractures. I'll come back to that later. 
So a type one, it is say in the C's rust that's saying somi or halobrase, but I would say color or even in very old patients, not even a color, but that might be disputable. Uh, we can discuss that. In type two, um, it's saying less than six millimeters density placements. It is saying a halobrase. Um, in my clinic, we do an anterior dense success at that moment. So maybe we are too aggressive. And um, if there's big displacement, then open reduction and institute fusion. And a type three, it's saying halo brace. And in our clinic, it's a color or somi brace. What's quite important, also uh, recommended by WFNS to use the classification of Grauer, in which there are different types of type two fractures, A, B, C. And for instance, this fracture can be very good amendable for an anterior dense success. Whereas this fracture looks like a type three fracture. But be careful because it can also be a type two class C with a fracture line to this difficult vascular, low vascular zone in which there's a high risk of pseudoarthrosis, malunion. So then if you look at these unstable fractures, it is with an intact transverse lagman to do an anterior dense fixation, anterior dense excess. If it is not intact, it doesn't have any sense to do an anterior dense excess screw fixation because you create C1, C2 instability. It might even become worse if you put in your screw. So if it is disrupted, do a C1, C2 fusion, and you can depend on what is your training and your amendability, how you do this C1, C2 fusions. Most of us use a posterior approach. Some people use an anterior approach to do a direct C1, C2 fixation. So some one example of a warning, um, if you treat patients with a type two fracture wrongly, and there is pseudoarthrosis, you can also create kyphosis. So this is, an instance, for instance, in my country, in which a patient was not treated well, and she came with swallowing problems, and she told that she had a type two fracture. She didn't tell us she had a type two fracture. She told us she had a trauma, and she was treated by a neck fracture. And that, fr that fracture was not followed up, and uh, she came with swallowing problems because of the hyperlordosis. But the most important problem is she was walking very badly, and she had this kyphotic deformity and a wrongly fused segment at the upper C-spine. So if you have this one, you need big surgery with a lot of risks, uh, high amount of instability with needs cranial vacuum fusion. So it's only a warning. We don't see it often, but we st see it still too much because every case in which it could be prevented is better to prevent than to perform this kind of surgery. So most of you might be aware and, uh, and are trained in your clinics, but we see that a lot of people are still a little bit afraid for the anterior dense success. I'm using navigation currently, but I'm also using the C-arm. So I'm not only uh, using the navigation CT scan, but also anterior dense success X-ray. And the positioning of the patient is more important and even more difficult than the surgery itself. With a very good positioning, extended X-ray, good position, also AP view with a pillow under the shoulders. If the position is good and it takes a while, I know, and people are getting impatient to do that. But if you have a good position, it's quite good to do the anterior dense gas. If you didn't position well, then you see a lot of failures. And you have to take aware if people have a very high thoracic cage uh, sternum, that it also might be difficult to put in your screw. And the mouth gag is for your anterior view. And it's also important for your CT navigation if you use that. We are used to the brown escalab um, anterior dense test of which was uh, demonstrated by Apfelbaum earlier. This is for the blade to push away the base of the tongue. And then you can enter this and you can see that in the books. First drill the upper part of C3 and then go to C2. 
it looks easy, but if you are not trained, it gives you difficulties. So these are those instruments, uh, very important if you put in your screw uh, that you have your position of your hands the other way around because you have otherwise the thoracic cavity. Uh, you enter it first with a key wire and after that you have to drill through and through. And mostly I use bicortical purchase here too, but it's not necessary in all cases. So there's a lot of discussion going on because I know that Dr. Apfelbaum was always using two screws. He's propagating that and a lot of other people also. Well, I don't see any evidence in favor of two screws. So sometimes I use two screws if one screw is not good. So if a screw is malpositioned, I use a second screw. But if the screw is in a good direction, I use one screw. So, but dense access problems exist. Also in our clinics, we see those problems like this breaking of a screw, uh, bad position of the screw, and even this, which I plucked from the internet, but we also had the same uh, in an old lady. She was the mother of two lawyers. So don't do that in the mother of two lawyers, these kind of dense access, because if this fails, then you have a big problem afterwards. So if you expect dense access problems, or if you live in an area where you don't have people doing anterior dense access in your clinic, then do a direct C1, C2 fixation or a marble fixation. We all know that the first one was not a harms, but Professor Go from India who promoted C1, C2 fixation and Professor Harms adapted it. Well, currently you can use this in young people to do a C1, C2 fixation and remove it after six months. Hopefully that you keep your rotation because one of the big drawbacks you all know is that if you do a posterior fixation, you lose your rotation. In my hands, I still feel comfortable if I don't want to put out the screws in six months or one year to do the transarticular C1, C2 fixation as described by Margel. Um, it's depending on the amount of training. So um, I always say, well, this is the most stable fixation. I can use it with X-ray, but you can also, what you see here is uh, the navigated part. So uh, this is navigated, cannulated wire in which you have one, your navigation, but also your X-ray in one screen. So it is, in my opinion, safe if you are trained well. And it might be superior to harms or wires, but to be honest, after dense fractures with a good harms fixation or gold harms fixation, it's, it's good enough. Um, wires I only use as an add-on to use to put in the bone. Currently, this is my personal opinion, not very much evidence-based. So if you do these kind of fixations, be aware beforehand on your CT scan, look at your vertebral artery. If there's a high riding vertebral artery like this patient, don't try to put in a screw here. Just do this one and do a direct C1, C2 or in this patient in which there were other problems, do a big fixation. So if you go for the odontal refractors and recommendations in elder patients, uh, AD is important, but as I said earlier, the PADI, posterior atlantic dental interval, might also be more important. If the odontal fracture is more than 40 millimeters displaced, there's a high risk of fracture in non-union. So you should have a surgical fixation in your armatorium. But again, in my clinic and also in other clinics, there's discussion in a very old one, the octogenarians of older than 80. And that's not the topic of this presentation. We do a study and we are currently less aggressive in the very old. Also because they don't play football anymore. And uh, that's also an important thing. Then hangers fractures, you all know, know them. It's quite easy to treat a type one fracture, maybe we use a color, but maybe no color is also possible. Type two fracture needs to be treated very carefully. Some use it conservatively and some surgery. This is very old fashioned picture, but I don't use it anymore. I do, do know that some clinics still use traction to, to arrange very good 
control and to have this kind of position. We are more in the use of phase surgery. We currently, I never use one screw. If there's one screw necessary, you can also do it conservatively. So mostly in our case, there are C2, C3 fixations. Is everything going well in our clinic? No, not very well. This is a very unstable trauma patient, intubated, and one of my colleagues put in traction on this patient. And this is what you see. So that's a little bit crazy in a hangman's fracture. So what is happening here? So traction was left alone, halo, construction was done, and this patient needed surgery before and after. This was the type 2A in which the trauma mechanism is distraction. So it's flexion, distraction, compression, action, and disflexion, instead of the other compression fracture in hangman's fracture. So type 2A is a dangerous one. And if you use the halo vest, for instance, in my patient, it was a huge guy like my uh, body, and he had a vena cava superior syndrome. So summarize hangman's fractures, Type three never occur in our clinics. We only sell one and the patient died. Type two, if I use need a halo brace, in our clinic we use surgery, but halo brace might be a very good option. And I know that some trauma center use it. If it's irreducible, you need to do surgery. And if you are not used in this kind of surgery, then refer the patient to a clinic where you can do that. So these are the WFNS recommendations. We had a lot of discussion about this one, the upright X-ray and the medical supervision may be useful besides CT scan, uh, but there was consensus to do that. For a Levine type 2A hangman's fracture, surgery is recommended. This was an expert opinion. We discussed it and there were people uh, pro and people con, but in the end there was consensus that it needs surgery. And a type three, if you see that, it might require both anterior and posterior surgery. And constant treatment, not with a high low vest. So some people agree with us, but because of its complications. So the same is true for a WFNS recommendation. Combined atlas and axis fractures, surgical treatment in case there's huge displacement of more than five millimeters. So again, for traction, please be careful, please be aware. This is a patient in our clinic, not treated by myself. Wilco, please unmute. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Was I mute? <laughs> so that was uh, nearly my last slide. One last um, Sentence from my side, advice, we are surgeons, we are looking at our fractures, but sometimes we forget that behind the fracture there's a spinal cord injury and there's a patient and the patient is a human being. And I like to advise you all to go back to your clinics and think about the follow-up. Thank you very much. So that was the end of Thank my you much, uh, Wilco. It was a wonderful presentation, as uh, usually we are used to hear from you. And it was a very good update on the on the matter. And uh, I really enjoy that. And I'm sure uh, the rest of the uh, people which are with us today. Um, so I think now we probably can um, can start with uh, some questions. I don't see uh, questions in the in the chat. Um, however, I, I have a few questions and I can start and probably uh, the rest will follow me. So I would like to ask uh, Professor Felling, uh, Michael, are you still with us? Hi there. Hi. So um, I would like to ask you this question. Now we are all living in the coronavirus crisis and we are, uh, we ha we are facing um, difficult decisions, we have to prioritize patients, we have to sometimes uh, decide which patient we have to operate, we have to choose from uh, the urgent, the most urgent sometimes. So I have, a, uh, I have this question for you. For example, you have a myelopath with MJOA 
uh, score 15. Uh, how would you prioritize that? How, uh, how urgent do you think you have to operate this man? And then same question if you have patient with MGOA uh, 14 and he's losing point because of uh, more instability. He is more unstable when walking. Okay, so in, in general, um, we have uh, transitioned our practice in Toronto to place a much higher priority on patients with cervical myelopathy. And what we have learned is that the surgery is uh, effective, it's cost effective, it improves health related quality of life and the outcomes are also related to the duration of symptoms and the baseline MGOA score. So if you watch patients deteriorate, they are going to have a worse outcome. So one needs to be very careful with this. And our healthcare system is not dissimilar to that in the British Isles. We have um, issues with wait lists and we're in a publicly funded system. The patient with the MGOA of 15, they would fall into the, um, the transition point between mild to moderate, they still would technically be in the mild range. And depending upon your clinical sense of the patient and the patient's wishes, one might have the option to consider non-operative management in that patient, but you would need to be prepared to watch that patient very carefully. Um, <clears throat> the patient who has, uh, um, transitioned to an MGOA of 14, I would put a high priority on. And the reason is that um, what we have learned is that the patients who transition to mild to moderate are on the steep point of decline. And if you intervene in a timely fashion on the patients with moderate uh, myelopathy, you can get them back to an excellent uh, level of function and they will report their health related quality of life as excellent. If you wait until they decline to where they're severe, they will still tend to improve with surgery, but they may not uh, get to the point where they feel that their outcome uh, is, is excellent. So in general, we have been prioritizing myelopathy cases during the corona pandemic. How soon will operate that uh, guy with uh, MGOA 14? How soon? Will I don't have, a, I, I basically have eliminated my waiting list. We just do them. So within a few weeks, we don't do them emergently, but I, I, I no longer have this one year, two year waiting list. We have really decided which patients are, uh, are of a higher priority. In the cervical myelopathy cases, once we see them, we just do them. Okay, as soon as possible. As soon as possible, basically, yes. Thank you, thank you. Right, um, I was, I think that was, um, uh, thank you so much for that answer. And again, that was um, an elucidating answer for, for uh, all of us. Um, I would like to ask one question, uh, Prof. Sepel, uh, with regards of the, um, uh, with, uh, with regards of C1, C2, uh, fixation options. Um, you mentioned that uh, transarticular is uh, probably the most stable uh, fixation in that segment, and I agree with you. There is uh, uh, there is a good uh, uh, there is a good data about that. There is a good paper from uh, US uh, from uh, Professor Hartle. Um, showing that exactly. Uh, he, he uses also uh, wires and he uh, thinks that wires plus, um, plus transarticular is really the, the best option. What I think about that and my second question is uh, in, your, in your institution, um, how safe is that option? I, I was working in a, in a department where they were calling the transarticular uh, approach transvertebral. What do, you, what do you say about that? <laughs> yeah. I, I remember, uh, I think it was 15 years ago when I was a young neurosurgeon, and I, I know that Michael Fagan had a discussion with, with Jurgen Harms uh, during a session. It was an expert opinion, a masterclass. I think it was in London, or I don't remember. And Jurgen Harms was quite aggressive that um, this transarticular fixation was a, a transvertebral artery fixation. I think... Um, it's most important that you have to perform it quite frequently. So when I said it 15 to 20 years ago, 
I was quite um, self-confident that you should use a trans article C1 2 fixation. Nowadays, uh, I have seen some problems in clinics where they don't have this experience. And if you don't have the experience to do that, it's better to do the direct C1, C2 by goal uh, harms. But also for that fixation, um, sometimes I lose a lot of blood. So maybe it's in my hands, not a, a very um, uh, easy product. Most of those are room retweet patients, which we don't see regularly anymore. Um, but I think if it's possible to do a drag C1, C2, it's not trans arterial vertebral, but you have to look at CT scan. And I have also in my clinic, I have some very good surgeons, much better than I am, and they try to risk something. And they see a high riding vertebral artery. And I not only warn them, but I also uh, say, don't do that. So if, if the vertebral artery is in the way. And to add to that, um, if you are used to doing direct C1, C2 fixations, why should you use the trans fixation? And the other question about the wires, I stopped wires a few years ago, but now I use them again with bone block because sometimes I see pseudoarthrosis in osteoporotic patients. And uh, those patients, I use a block. Um, but if it's a young patient, I use a direct C1, C2 fixation and I uh, make a little bit with a curette between the joint of C1, C2 and um, the screw also takes the bone. So I see good fusion. Thank you. I have. Uh, I, I I would agree with that. What you just said, and uh, I think uh, wire uh, could be a good addition for extra stability. I have seen uh, our friend uh, Professor Ortel from um, uh, from Germany. He he was showing um, construct when he will use transarticular screw plus hook at C1, uh, which. Uh, I, I, I think it's a, it's a good construct as well, but unfortunately, I don't have this here. Yes. It's, also, <laughs> this, uh, it's also quite expensive. Yeah. And I know that yeah. um, one of the Swedish surgeons, uh, Klaus Olerud, uh, yeah. was also promoted. I think his father uh, did it the first time. And we used in the past too, but I think it's, it's extra, it's a lot of extra money. And, and, and only a trans article screw is only 45 euros in my country. So if I use two, it's, uh, I can do a lot of other surgeries for that. And the hooks are quite expensive. I also saw a question from the, from the chat in which people said, how many times I think that, um, how many times um, did you, Dr. Deepak, uh, yeah, said that, asked that. How many times do you see um, a complication by this bicortical purchase in enter a dance success well i didn't see it yet but i have to be honest that one time i used the key wire to do that and then i was shocked because when i had the key wire in place uh, the key wire was moving forward and i looked at the x-ray and the key wire was in the uh, frame magnum so i was completely shocked and my heart was beating like hell but the patient didn't have anything so i would say if you use your key wire, don't go through the bone, but stop at the cortical bone. You can feel it. And then with your tap, go through that. Never go through it. So I had that with the anterior dance success and I had with the Margo fixation. And on both incidents, it's quite a few years ago, I had an angel on my shoulder and also the patient had an angel. We didn't see anything. But I can imagine that a very dangerous complication can happen. Paolo, you want to take some questions from the chat and ask a few questions, please. Yeah, sorry, I have some uh, some issues with with my my connection. Uh, to and thank you very much for for your for your presentations, and it, it's a pleasure seeing both of you here. And uh, Vilko, I, I learned I learned from Vilko how to put transarticular screw you one C two quite a long time ago here in Porto. Uh, in fact, I'm not using them anymore <laughs> because <laughs> because I'm using segmental fixation. But it was very, th those were great times here uh, to to have here. Uh, so um, one one issue that we have been discussing is that when you look, we look at the literature, 
we we see a lot of guidelines for uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy and on the other hand for traumatic spinal cord uh, 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 for spinal cord injury but not that many to to traumatic central cord injury uh, so um, what you what's your opinion about that about timing for surgery about I would like to have both of your your opinions. I, I, I just gave a I just gave a lecture actually yesterday to another group in the uh, World Federation of, uh, of, 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 of of neurosurgeons on this topic. So we have um, some new data that that are coming out. So in general, I would view traumatic central cord injury as a variant of a severe incomplete cervical spinal cord injury. And the, the trajectory of the outcomes are very similar to other forms of an incomplete cervical spinal cord injury. And so the patients are either Asian impairment scale C or D and their trajectory of outcomes are largely defined by their baseline, uh, by their baseline neurology. So we have uh, new data that are emerging that do show um, the impact of early surgery, of one of surgery and two of early surgery in patients with central cord syndrome. So in general, I would advocate surgical treatment for patients with central cord syndrome, and if possible, to try to do it early. The challenge in central cord syndrome, as uh, Wilco had outlined in his elegant talk, is that we're dealing with an older age population who may have medical comorbidities. And so there you now need to balance the medical risks versus the potential benefits of surgery. And then that becomes quite, you know, quite the art. So if you have a younger patient without significant medical comorbidities, um, I'm operating on patients with central cord syndrome, and I'm operating early. I'm treating them like a severe incomplete cervical cord injury. If a patient is coming in and they have a lot of health issues, then one needs to deal with those first. You, 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 you cannot just take them to the operating room. Okay, so early means uh, next morning or same day, if that. Well, can... early. Well, early is early, um, but the way we've defined early in the, uh, you know, in the studies is within 24 hours, and 24 hours does appear to be an inflection point. So we have new data that will be that are in press in in uh, Lancet Neurology, where we did um, a, a large analysis of a combined um, uh, uh, a data set. And Wilco may be aware of these data, but um, yeah. Um, but <clears throat> essentially, we, we did show that um, early surgery within 24 hours has an impact. And in fact, if you look at the timing within the 24-hour time window, there is a time dependency of, of that impact. The, 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 the fascinating aspect, it requires tremendous clinical judgment from the treating surgeon because you have to be aware of your team the logistics, the safety of when you can get a patient there, um, and then also the medical status of the of the you know of of the patient, and it will require quite a bit of organization from an infrastructure uh, perspective. So, in general, I, from a personal perspective, I don't generally see a benefit to going in at three o'clock in the morning versus seven o'clock in the morning to operate on a case from a practical perspective. I think it's generally safer to do it during, during daylight hours because the team is better. Um, uh, but you know, that will, you know, that will, that will, that will vary. So I would say that this is an evolving area. I'd be interested in Wilco's perspectives, but I think one of the real challenges here is that the epidemiology of spinal cord injury is changing, at least in, in, in um, Europe, North America, some parts of Asia, um, in that the incidence is stable, but we're seeing fewer young people, more older individuals, more falls, more cervical injuries. 
And right now in North America, at least, uh, traumatic central cord syndrome has become the commonest type of spinal cord injury we're seeing. And it's really a challenge. Like I'm having to relearn how to manage spinal cord injury because we're now dealing with an older age population. Yeah, thank you. And just let me insist in, in, in one point because usually those patients are patients with multi-level disease. It's not just a, just a ACDF or so. So usually those patients require either a laminectomy infusion, a multi-level laminectomy or infusion, or multi-level ACDF or combination of cotectomy or, 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 or any kind of, of combination. So also, uh, even the time, the, the duration of surgery, the, the, the need, uh, the, the expertise for the team uh, is, um, is, is an issue. So, uh, does it make any difference in your practice if, it, if, if the patient needs a, a four-level decompression infusion or just a, a, a traumatic disc herniation that just require ACDF? Sure. Regarding timing or... Yeah, sure. So we occasionally see patients who have a single level yeah. disc herniation or pathology and that, that is fairly straightforward to manage as a very quick surgery, fairly low risk. Most patients are not like that. Most patients have multi-level spondylosis. Most of the patients in my hands are treated posteriorly. It is a more significant surgery. It does require greater expertise from the surgical team, but also the anesthetic team and the nursing team. So you need to take this into consideration. So a patient like that, I, I would not be happy to take that patient to the operating room like at three in the morning. Uh, that, that is, would be very challenging, at least in our clinic in Toronto. At seven in the morning, it's just very interesting how things are completely different. It's like night and day in the same clinic. So you have to take this into consideration in terms of the logistics and the safety and, and so on. This is a balance. And this is why I'm saying this is requires a lot of judgment um, in terms of how to apply this. But the principle here is that time is spine, that surgical yeah. decompression does have a positive impact. And, and now we need to think about the judgment. And then the other side of this as well is that we have wonderful uh, uh, tools and approaches with surgery, but what is correct surgery? What is decompression? So in the studies we, I have done, I haven't really even touched this. So I, you know, I just say, oh, well, it's surgery. Well, surgery is not surgery, as we know, right? And so the next challenge now is to actually establish, you know, what is the correct surgery? What is a decompression? How do we do the decompression? And these are the kind of the evolving, uh, these will be the evolving challenges. So, so many uh, un unanswered questions that will require, you know, very careful prospective clinical research. Yeah, definitely. What about in uh, in Leiden and Hag? Uh, uh, to, to, uh, to add to that, Michael, uh, he was already saying it so so I was keeping it secret, but uh, you all have to look out for February because I think it will be February that the Lancet paper of Michael will come out. And it's for two reasons important. It's the first paper in which there's a, um, in which uh, the more granular data are used of individual patient data, and I think what also is happening is that, um, and I, I applaud Michael for that, uh, and it's not because I'm putting feathers in his, in his mouth and things like that, but he is making us aware that we are underestimating the effects of spinal cord injury by myelopathy, but also by traumatic incidences. So because of the, I, I'm, that, that's the reason why I'm very happy that Michael is, is with his group is publishing this paper and that the Lancet is willing to publish this paper. There will also be an editorial comment from uh, some of the other surgeons uh, from whom I'm one. And um, I'm very happy with that because in a lot of hospitals, it's very difficult to see this as an urgent case because people say, well, there's no evidence. So in Leiden and The Hague, we have a clinic with 23 surgeons. So I'm in luxury position with 10 spine surgeons. So we have now separate duty. So we have a brain duty, and spine duty. So in my clinics, we now have say, well, we do surgery within eight hours, even in the middle of the night. But I know that's very difficult and you have your teams completely set up. Um, 
Wow. That's, 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 promote, that's very I promote, impressive, Wilco. Yeah. It's very yeah. impressive. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, but I'm a luxury position, so I'm. It's a lot of management, but uh, yeah. That's a that's a that's a tremendous infrastructure that you've established. Uh, congratulate congratulations uh, congratulations. Uh, for it. After Febru after February, Michael, everybody who's sitting here will use your paper and say, "Well, Professor <laughs> Broto saying we have to be uh, to go urgent." I so. hope I hope the people will not be too cross with me. Because <laughs> it, it's going to, I think, pose some a few more challenges uh, uh, for us. But seriously, I think all of us are, are, are in neurosurgery and spine surgery to help patients. So I think if we recognize that we can help patients, I think all of us are willing to, um, you know, to go the extra, to go the extra length and not worry so much about convenience. Yeah. It's only the managers will not be happy, otherwise the surgeons will be, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the managers may not be happy, but society will be happy because, uh, you know, the outcomes uh, of spinal cord injury and of degenerative cervical myelopathy are very, very expensive. And the managers will do what, what the next level above that will do. And that's where the decisions will come from. Then the managers will be happy because then they'll have the numbers where they're supposed to track this. So don't worry about the managers. The managers come and go, as you know, but we tend to stay. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And Vilko, you also tend to operate most of those patients from a posterior approach or, or anterior? Yeah. How is that in light of? It, it depends on the... It depends on the, the amount of compression anteriorly, but mostly we go posteriorly. But if there's a reason that anteriorly is more easy, then I go anteriorly. And um, I agree with Michael that anterior surgery is um, is uh, a little bit more easy for the patient with comorbidity. But some surgeons don't like anterior surgery, so that's um, so. But we do we do anterior, posterior, and sometimes lateral approach, but that's very seldom. Thank you. So, uh, Let me uh, put another another question. We have talked about uh, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we have, we have talked about this, Michael, with uh, with uh, when uh, in a, a recent webinar that you told that uh, you tend to treat every level in patients with degenerative cervical myelopathy. Uh, if it's uh, you don't uh, tend to look what is the level that has most compression. You tend to treat every level that uh, that is compressed. But what do you think is the is the importance of alignment on this? Is the sagittal alignment an issue, or or just the compression is what you you look for? Yeah. So I I think that um, the you know the the path of physiology of DCM involves both um, a static component and a dynamic component. So there's the compression, but then there's the issues related to instability, alignment, and so on. Now, it is not necessary to get a perfect realignment in patients. So patients can have a very acceptable clinical result with a relative loss of lordosis. So you don't have to be perfect in the reconstruction of, of uh, lordosis. But um, one does need to pay attention to sagittal alignment. If there's a significant kyphosis, if patients are K-line negative or K-line positive, you need to take this into consideration uh, for sure. And then, um, so yeah, so I think it's important to look at. And then in terms of the you know, the techniques of, uh, the techniques of decompression, um, you know, there's judgment that's required for sure, because, um, uh, you know, do, if you have minor spondylosis at other levels, do those always need to be treated? Perhaps not, if there's a very dominant level of compression. But on the other hand, um, particularly if you're doing a posterior approach, you have to be aware of cord shift. And so uh, the, what can occur is if you do a little more limited posterior decompression, you can get cord shift, and this can then result in impingement of the cord at another level. So this is something particularly that I've kind of learned with doing the posterior, with doing the posterior decompressions. 
with the anterior approach, it's much, it's much easier to be more focal. The posterior approach, because of the chord shift, it's often, in my hands at least, better to be a bit more um, uh, proactive in terms of dealing with multi-segment uh, issues. Uh, we see, I see Mehmet here. Mehmet, welcome. Hi, how are you? Uh, Hi, Mehmet. Sorry for uh, missing the first part, actually, I just joined you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for joining us. Uh, I have one, one comment from Michael uh, about the uh, posture decompression. Are you for, uh, in OPLL cases, are you for uh, application of uh, uh, fixation and fusion uh, instead of laminoplasty for OPLL cases? Yeah, so we, we actually have a surprising number of OPLL cases in Toronto because we have a very large uh, Asian community. So, um, Earlier in my career, before uh, the more modern lateral mass fixation uh, technologies became available, I was doing um, pretty much exclusively laminoplasties posteriorly. But I've kind of now evolved to where most cases posteriorly I manage with a laminectomy infusion because I find it's very versatile. And um, I am, have been happy with that approach, but I still am using uh, laminoplasty in younger patients. Um, but I would say the majority of the patients I'm treating with a laminectomy infusion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I, you you I want to like ask to... a couple, uh, you know, Francisco's question there, maybe you could ask that. Francisco Sorry? Costa asked a question there. He's asking, okay. Wilco, yeah. what is your experience in removing C1, C2 posterior fixation screws? Is it yeah, valuable I, for recovery of rotation or not? Francisco, I've seen the question, yeah. yeah. I, I saw the question. I, I tried to evade it because uh, I know <laughs> that uh, I know that in Germany, they, um, they have a lot more experience, but they never published it. I tried uh, to promote it in a few patients. In a, a very young patient, I re already removed it after three months. And that patient has a rotation back. But to be honest, the other ones, the were elderly, I did that. And after six months, the elderly said, well, it's okay. So I don't have that need for the, that rotation. Um, so but um, I'm still waiting on the publication about um, uh, the group of, of Jürgen Harms. Um, he's not working anymore, but his other groups. But I don't, I didn't see the data. I don't know if Michael knows that or somebody else, but... Uh, Michael, do you know they, they, they didn't publish it? I think. Eh? No, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of it. I know that they're big proponents of. Um, you know, I've seen many talks and discussions at like the German Spine Society about that, but I haven't seen too much. Uh, you know, you know, too much, too much data. So it would be interesting to see. I personally am not uh, removing the fixation. So, like yourself, uh, Wilco, I, I. I, I like doing the dens fixation. Um, I, most of the odontoid fractures I'm seeing now though are older individuals and they have osteoporosis. They have a lot of other issues. Yeah. And I have, have had a tendency to do go more posteriorly. I really like the dens fixation. Um, and you're right, you're absolutely correct. The positioning is key, the decision-making. Once you get in, you have everything positioned. It's a pretty straight shot. Yeah. But if you, if you're, it, there's very little room for technical error there. If your screw is too anteriorly, it will fail. It will pull out, particularly yeah. in, in an older. I know, I know it's the case you were showing you, you, you very nicely, you had it right at the base there. This yeah. is absolutely, uh, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely key. Yeah. So Francesco, hey, Francesco, I'm always saying it, but uh, to be honest, um, I'm very reluctant to do to promote that. Only very young patients, and the young patients, I promote and enter and success. So, uh, but thank you for the question. I try to evade it. 
I wanted to ask okay, uh, one of the, yeah, sorry, one of the lecturers, what is, what is the dynamic MRI scan? Uh, how, how many of your spondylotic myelopathy patients you are uh, scanning with dynamic MRI scan and how is that affecting your decision making? We, um, I, well, we, don't, we do not have upright MRI available in Toronto, so I'm not doing that because it's not available. And I, I rarely find that a flexion extension MRI is necessary. So usually one can figure it out. Very occasionally in a patients with congenital laxity, one may wish to get an MRI scan. So for example, some of the patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome can be quite challenging to evaluate. So occasionally, uh, a dynamic MRI might be available there, but I, I only do it. I only do that maybe a, a handful of times a year. And uh, we have a lot of patients going to London. You might also see them in Belfast. There's a commercial clinic in London, in which people with Ehlers Danlos or ME are getting an upright MRI. I'm uh, please let's let's have the evidence. So hopefully we can because there's a lot of discussion about it. And um, I think we have to be aware this upright MRI and the flexion deflection, I don't see the added value yet, but it might be that there is an issue because I know that uh, one of the guys in Barcelona and one of the surgeons in Washington in the US is uh, performing those fixation in, in which they see in a flexion MRI, they see some compression, but I don't see it. So um, I have to be very careful what I say now because a lot of people are on the, on the chat room. We are now busy with the study, trying to look at it, but also look at it with normal controls. So it's especially in the group of Elis, the Elis Dandels, um, and then you have the very severe Elis Dandels, but also the subtiles ones and those people with ME, um, the myalgic encephalopathy. Um, I'm not very much in favor, unless we could do a good study. Yeah. I think in Belf yeah. Belfast, you also see those patients are going to London to this MRI, I think. Yeah. I have, I have uh, seen a few and I have operated a few. Uh, there was a patient that was seen by all of us and it was uh, discussed on multidisciplinary meeting and it was decided that this is not compression there, but then the patient had dynamic MRI scan and then we've seen clearly buckling of the ligament. We've seen clearly uh, narrowing that is more than it was with the neutral MRI scan. And then we had to operate and the patient got better. So um, I think there is a room for that and a room for that. And uh, now my radiologist started doing not, it's not a standing MRI scan, but uh, they started doing flexion and extension MRI scan in a, in a uh, supine position. So I, I find this helpful and we are collecting data with yeah, I think yeah. we are doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you get the mark to show right? the MCQs? Yeah. yeah. So, Michael, do you want to take these questions, please? Oh, sure. Okay. So, I guess these were my uh, uh, questions. So, which of the following conditions is considered a diagnosis under the overarching term of general cervical myelopathy? So mark all the answers which are correct. So DCM is, is intended to be an overarching term. So cervical spondylotic myelopathy is the most common form. So that is definitely there. OPLL for sure. Uh, ossification ligamentum flavum, a less common condition, but that is a variant of that. Um, central cord injury and the tumor are not under the condition of degenerative cervical myelopathy. So central cord injury is a traumatic spinal cord injury that's different and tumors are, are, are different. So this is intended to reflect so benign, non-neoplastic, non-traumatic conditions. Okay, so the uh, preferred outcome measure to classify DCM into mild, moderate, and severe is which of the following. So the correct answer is the MGOA uh, scale. So the MGOA scale is a zero to 18 uh, point uh, scale. It looks at upper extremity, lower extremity function, sensory function, and bladder function. Uh, 18 is perfect. So 18, you do not have myelopathy. 15 to 17 is mild. Uh, 12 to 14 is moderate and less than 12 is, uh, is, is, um, is, is severe.
the preferred management. Okay, so I was actually asked this by Nick um, in a sense. So uh, the preferred management for patients with uh, cervical cord compression with, uh, with DCM, with mild gait impairment, no, not requiring assistive devices, mild hand numbness, mild loss of, gait dex, uh, of hand dexterity, MGOA 15. So uh, which, which of the following are correct? So one is uh, basically reassurance and get out of my clinic. Well, that may not be the best approach. The second is discussion of surgical treatment as an option. Yes, that would be correct. It, it is an, it, it's a valid option. Referral for structured physiotherapy with um, uh, you know, careful follow-up and you know, surgery if the patient uh, declines. So uh, 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 yes, that is... Um, that's valid. Um, surgery does not need to be done on an on an urgent um, on an urgent uh, 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 basis. So essentially, in this situation, you have the option to consider either surgery or non-operative management, and then careful follow up with the patient. I think this was my final question. So which of the following uh, neuroprotective agents was examined in the CSM Protect randomized trial? So the answer is Riliazol. And um, the outcomes with Riliazol are imperfect. So <laughs> to be, and you, you, know, you live or die by your primary outcome measure, um, but there were some promising results seen with neuropathic pain. So my hope will be that you know, people might try the use of Riliazol. It's relatively inexpensive. It's a, available in generic form. We're currently uh, examining uh, some subsets of patients. My, my sense is that we, we have seen a reduction in delayed C5 palsy and a reduction in the severity in the patients with Riliazol, but I need to validate this, but certainly the results in terms of the reduction of neuropathic pain appear to be uh, promising. And in the study, um, I uh, wish that I would have had better outcome measures to look at pain. So I think this is something that is of value to patients and probably as we're looking at the outcomes, we probably wanna pay a bit more attention uh, to pain outcomes. So thanks, I think that was my last question. Okay, this is for after a fortnight, and we have uh, our moderator, Nicola P, who's going to be talking about transferminal discectomy in a fortnight, and we have Scott Robertson, uh, who's going to be talking about spinal metastasis, uh, innovative uh, treatments. Uh, among the moderators, we have Paolo, who's there, and uh, Doug Orr from Cleveland, and Mama Zadidi, who's the co-chair of the WFNS Spine Committee. So you all are most welcome. Yusuf Sheikh is our young neurosurgeon coordinator who's going to be coordinating with everybody. So welcome, everybody. Uh, can we have um, everybody to switch on their videos so that we can have a group photograph, please? And then we all can smile. Please switch on your videos. Thank you. And smile, everybody. Rilko's cool smile is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Are we done? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's done. And can you unshare, please, uh, Imad? Brilliant. Uh, to the two moderators, please. Yeah, so it was a pleasure being with all of you and uh, I really enjoyed the, the talks and it was really nice and uh, fruitful discussion. I hope this was um, a very, very good uh, for, the, for the juniors that we had today and um, hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much and look forward for for next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you, Yoko and Michael, Bye. for... Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, Mama.